This message is a gift to you from Calvary Bible Church in Wichita, Kansas. And we have to have a realistic viewpoint, a mindset, understanding of our wealth and, and, and all the possessions and things that we have um, to be able to, to serve God. Because the Lord said you can't serve God in stuff, mammon, things, material possessions, Jesus said. Um, and yet so easily, especially in our culture, it can seep into our hearts, your heart and my heart, in, in, in what we serve and in, in what is important and what is most valuable. And so we come to this passage in a very, again, hard-hitting, maybe it doesn't seem like it applies to me and to you, but there are ramifications that you and I can gain from it. So let's look at this. It's interesting as we look into this, and your notes, I'll get to your notes here real fast. Well, actually, before we begin, I'm going to say I always try to get ahead of myself, but I want you to know this just in case there's some here that say, Jim, you keep talking about end time stuff and, and, you know, why again? Well, I'll tell you why again, because we ran into it again. You know what? And you can't get away from it when you're looking in Scripture. I mean, it seems I, I, I cannot name you a single epistle off the top of my head that does not have at least one allusion or some allusion to the end times or to the return of Christ and what that means to the believer. I just I can't. Um, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we keep running into this reality because it is so crucial to the believer's life. In fact, it is so crucial that Paul says in Romans 8, get this, 23 through 24, I remind you from previously going over this a few months ago. And not only this, verse 23, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, get this, he's talking about in this chapter the importance of the Holy Spirit. We talked a few weeks ago on that, right? There's something amazing, dynamic, wonderful about having the Holy Spirit in your life. But even with you, on your best day, with the Holy Spirit in your life, has a problem. And this is what he says. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption, our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, for in this hope we are saved. Meaning that Paul said, again, with the spirit in you on your best day, things going good in life. Even then, at that very point, something is groaning inside of you saying, all with creation before this in Romans 80, saying, Lord Jesus, come restore, renew, make this thing, turn this thing around because we're this is not it. I don't care what the Reformed theology buffs out there say. I don't care what all millennialists say. I don't care what most of the church believes out there, the kingdom now type that says, well, we can pray the kingdom down here and we can make you know heaven happen here and we can sing cute songs and all that stuff and it's just going to be a lot better and we're going to continue to get better. The progressive mindset that's out there, hogwash, baloney. You and I see the news, we know it's not going to get better until Christ comes. I watched the debate this last week. Minus Donald Trump, and I actually enjoyed it to some degree. Um, and and yet, and get this, and yet every word I heard felt empty. I mean, it was it was again, it wasn't as as demeaning and you know demoralizing, but but it felt empty. And I hope it did for each one of you that listened to it, because the, there's something in me, and I hope in you, it's the spirit saying, you know what, they can't fix it. None of them can fix it. Aside from Christ. And, and, and he can lead, sure, and there's going to be some dynamics that, that if we would get a believer in office that things can change and maybe some things can be... But ultimately, Christ is going to have to come fix the mess we're in. And so we get to this place in this, this study and we've got to deal and wrestle with the end again. And so that's where we're at. And I want you to remember as we continue in this study, as we look in James 5, live by faith and not fatalism. When you hear this stuff, this doesn't mean that, again, you throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. You, you all of a sudden you hear about possessions and you start selling everything or I'm going to, you know, uh, you know, unleash my, you know, IRA. And, you know, if you do, well, great. I, I've got some great places you can give it to, you know, kind of thing. But, 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 but before that's fatalism, folks, that's taking this stuff way out of proportion, out of context. Listen to what the Spirit's going to say to you and to me as we encounter this information. Some people might look at end-time study and they might, you know, see a prepper show or they might, you know, look at end-time stuff and they might think, you know, my life is over, woe is me, you know, or I've got to head to the hills or this, that, or the other thing. And, and a lot of that's fatalism, folks. That's just, they're, they're, they're dying, literally, by the information they're hearing. And they aren't preparing or they aren't they aren't understanding. They aren't gaining from the information that they hear. So don't we live by faith. We walk by faith. We have substance. We have the word of God telling us what to do and how to do it. Don't just respond 
impulsively like you and I do most of the time when we go by that favorite restaurant or Krispy Kreme or Hertz Donut or whatever. So James 1, we're going to look through, or James 5, 1 through 8, we're going to look through these eight verses today. We won't get to all of it, but we'll save a lot, or some, for next week as well. Let's look at verse 1 and 2 to start. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. First thing I want you to see, actually we can read through the second whole verse. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, and then verse 3 continues and says your silver and gold are corroded. Now, most scholars that I run into commentating on this that believe in a more of a literal view of eschatology or what's going to happen in the end see three components that James drops here in what's going to get destroyed. And this is a very interesting way of looking at it. I I think there's a lot of credence to it. We're going to look at it in that lens today. So in your notes, three types of wealth destruction concerning materialistic non-believers. And non-believers are key because you're going to see that he contrasts here, verse 6, 7, and 8, those who believe, those who are different than what we're going to see in the first few verses. Not that there aren't lessons that we can't gain from the first few verses, so don't tune out, please. But there is a stark contrast that James is making that there are some in the church that are like this, and he's giving them a lesson or a warning, and then there's going to be some in church like this, verse 6, 7, and 8, following, that, 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 Maybe don't have to hear it as harshly, but there, again, there's lessons here to, to, to hear. So this is written three types of destruction specifically for the non-believer because I believe they'll be here during the tribulation. And, and, and again, this is make that contrast. So first thing, first thing, three types. First one, stuff's going to rot. Stuff will rot. Huh. It's interesting. If you look in the original language here, verse 2, your riches are corrupted. The idea here is the material things, or not the material, the the things that can rot. The the word corrupted is also uh, transliterated or or, or translated rotting, or rot, some things that rot. And so that's the idea here that James is saying, there's going to be stuff that you're going to own that's going to rot. Interesting. What do you have that will rot? I think, think about that. Cats, there you go. Oh, 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 a house. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, you know. Either. Sorry, sorry. I know, I know you love your cats, Gary, but. <laughs> um, stuff, stuff is going to rot. Get this, Revelation 6, 5 through 6. We see some pictures, and I'm going to give you little glimpses. Revelation is too much of a task to take on headlong in this study. But there are little glimpses and pictures of the end that I want you to see as we look through this. That stuff is just going to rot. And, and, and to the point that we see that, that uh, there's, well, some things that I mentioned in chapter 8, verse 7, there's vegetation issues at the first trump that's blown. You can check it out on your own time. In the third trump that's blown, water is going to be messed with to the point that it's killing people. I mean, the, there's stuff that's just, just a dynamic of, of waxing bad or getting bad, stuff just rotting, stuff not being able to be consumed anymore that we see very ha- very clearly happening in Revelation. One thing that's very interesting that, uh, that John mentions here in chapter 6, uh, verse 5 and 6, when he opened the third seal, I heard the living creatures, or the, I heard the third living creature say, come see. So I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius or that's a day's wage and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. We're seeing here a picture of what he's hearing is a picture of famine in the land. Now, whether it's going to be literally, you know, that you're not going to be able to buy that loaf of bread like you used to, but you're going to have to just buy a quart of, you know, wheat, and that's going to cost you, you know, whatever you make in a day. I, I mean, it might not be that literal, but the reality remains is that there's going to be a shortage to the fact that things are going to cost so much that famine is going to hit the land so bad that things are going to be that desperate that you can get some of this stuff that's going to cost you a lot and don't even harm the oil, the oil and the wine. That, that's going to be, uh, uh, those are commodities that are just going to be so hard to get hold of. And, and I see this stuff that in, in, in relation 
in Revelation, rather, that shows that there's just going to be a time when stuff is going to go away that you and I are used to. The, the life that you and I lead, the, 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 the stuff that's just going to rot, is just going to, it's, it's going to go like that. Listen to this. Talking about famine and statistics, talking about abundance and statistics. Let's look at this. By 2009, one billion people were classified as hungry. There are numerous uh, regional famines in the United Nations estimated that 200, almost a quarter million, over a quarter million people, 258,000 people died in the, um, or in the Somalian famine between October 2010 and April 2012. That was a roughly or close to 5% of the population died in that famine during those two years. And that they have not seen that before. That was one of those statistics that this thing, this article mentioned that they had not seen before in that population, that large amount of a population dying of famine. Since 1900, more than 70 million people have died from direct famine. Interesting. And, and we would be ignorant to say that everybody just has access to grocery stores. Everybody has access to... You know, food all the time. We live in a bubble, folks. You know, and I don't want to belittle anybody that lives in one of these these food deserts that have been talked about in the last few weeks around here since there's been some Walmarts that have closed. Um, and some small towns really feel like it feels like a food desert 30, 40 miles until, you know, the nearest grocery store. Uh, but we don't know. I mean, we don't understand. I mean, food desert, really? Uh, when I read that, when I saw the headline, I just about laughed because... How can you find a food desert in this country when there are people all over the world that, that really know what a food desert is? We'd be ignorant to pass over these things and realize not only that, but this. From FeedingAmerica.org, 70 billion pounds of food will be wasted in America this year. An estimated, get this, 25 to 40 percent of food grown, processed, and transported in the U.S. will never be consumed. It's grown, but it goes straight to the garbage can. (laughs) Or your dog. I don't, you know, I guess we can count them. Maybe it gets consumed. We'll count your dog, Gary. It's school or school lunch. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) 20 to 40, get that, 20, 40 to 45 percent. We live in an abundance, folks, and things are rotting. Things are rotting. We're throwing them out. And and, and again, this is not some progressive agenda that I'm posting. They're trying to scare you with facts or statistics. I want you to realize, though, that it's easy to live in a wealthy nation and not realize that things are rotting. You and I, we throw out stuff all the time. You know, I feel guilty because half of what my girls eat all the time really finds a trash often, you know, because it's the reality of a two-year-old parent. That's why, again, fatalism. I'm not going to feed you kids anymore. There's kids starving in China. You know, that would be fatalism, right? That would be a mad dad, you know, Um, because the reality of a two-year-old parent, they're not always going to eat everything, Um, and that guilt will be there. But, but, wow, we've got to sober up to these statistics, folks. Things are going to rot, and they are right now. They are. And we're letting it because of the abundance that we have in this country. It's amazing. It's scary. It's really scary because when we look at this saying your riches are corrupted, we could find ourselves in this very easily. Save us knowing Christ. Next thing. Let's look at the next thing here. Materials are going to fade. It not only says there in riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten. And now, you know, you can look up and down in Revelation and Daniel and the prophets and try to find where moths are, you know, is there going to be a moth invasion in the end? You know, it may feel like that here, especially if we don't get some some of the good freezing down, you know, come the come the uh, the spring and whatnot. No, but no, we don't see that. But we see some strange things happening in Revelation. And to say that I understand it all would, would just be would be would be uh, ignorant. It wouldn't be doing you a service. Because I, I don't know exactly what this all looks like. But Revelation 9, 4 through 6 brings an interesting thing about locusts. Now, these aren't normal locusts from what it sounds like when you read about this. But we do see that there's just going to be a materialism in this world that we know that's not going to matter anymore. It's going to fade. Get this. They were commanded, these locusts, commanded uh, Revelation 9, 4 through 6, not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. 
Verse 5, and they, were not, or, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and not find it. They will desire to die, and, the death, and death will flee from them. Can you imagine, guys, get this. This is a picture of the, the tribulation. Again, during that seven-year time frame that we see in Revelation mentioned, Daniel talks about. That's coming when the, when, when the Antichrist is ruling on this earth. That there are going to be men, and most men, are not going to be seeking out pleasures in this world. They're not going to be seeking out the fun things that they used to do. They're not going to be seeking sporting events. They're not going to be seeking concerts. They're going to be seeking death. Materials are going to fade. Materialism is going to fade because there's nothing, none of that worth living for. It's all going away. And there are these things, whatever these locusts look like. And it continues on and talks about these locusts. And they don't look like just typical locusts. They got, you know, horse-like figures and strange sounds. I mean, there's some weird stuff that's going on here. And whether those are specifically literal, which they could be, whether or not this is symbolic, but there's going to be that dire, desperate kind of situation because of whatever God manifests in, the, in this sense that leaves men so desperate that they'd rather just die, but they can't. However you believe and want to shake that out, I tell you one thing, materials are going to fade. And that stuff that you're going after, stuff that you have, that you really hold on to a whole lot right now and you really like, you know, that car, that house, that, you know, whatever, that... that, that that favorite coat, that favorite, you know, whatever, those pair of shoes, whatever it may be, it's going to fade. It ain't going to be worth living for. There's not going to be a whole lot worth living for in that, in that time. Aren't you glad that there's a distinction made? And we'll get there. Don't, don't, don't Hang on. There's a lot of hope here. <laughs> Aren't you glad there's a distinction for the believer and the non-believer? And that's just how it is with the tribulation. Guys, there's too many people out there preaching a post-trib view. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit this morning here in our prayer time beforehand. A lot of people, a lot of good pre-tribbers that once were pre-trib, they believe that Christ is going to come rescue them from this time of the tribulation. They're starting to hear these interesting, maybe entertaining, maybe, you know, interesting arguments that are trying to sway them. And they're looking at Revelation in different eyes and they're and getting confused. But there's clear distinctions in these things. Non-believers are going to go through this. Believers have a hope. Have a promise. So again, when you hear these things, don't get discouraged. But this is the truth for those people at that time during that seven-year tribulation. Materials are going to fade. Not only are things going to rot totally. I mean, this is abundance. It's just all this stuff. It's going to rot, but there's going to be materials that are going to fade. And I find this interesting as we're seeing some of this, these dynamics of these rich people that are even infiltrating the church in Jerusalem that James is confronting very, very directly. He's saying your stuff's going to rot. He's saying your materials are going to fade. Jesus would say very clearly, as he did to the church there in Laodicea in chapter 3 of Revelation, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that shame of your nakedness would not be Reveal. Talking about moth-eaten garments. The idea here of garment is key. It's important to understand, especially when you're looking at end-time stuff. Because there's a dynamic that you can see very clearly throughout the book of Revelation that the garment is going to be very important. There are going to be moth-eaten garments. There's going to be materials that are going to fade. There's going to be all that. that that's what James is saying to the non-believer. But to the believer... The one that repents, the one that finds faith in Christ and him alone, he will be arrayed in white. He will be put in a white garment. And in fact, I love this in Revelation 16, when things are just looking really bad, I mean really bad, towards the end, looking real bad. Jesus keeps interjecting to those who keep reading and keep studying this stuff. Verse 15 throws a little tidbit of truth in there. I love this. Behold, I'm coming into the he, he, He's talking about all this, these dynamics of Revelation. And he stops right in the middle of it and, and, and inserts this verse. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then he continues on. He's, it's what, he, he, he drops that truth right there in, in, ch- in chapter 16, verse 15. Or, uh, verse 15. He, he says here very clearly, he's, be careful with your garments, folks. You're arrayed in white, you'll be in heaven. It's going to be a glorious thing. You're not going to be sh- put to shame, in other words, during that seven. You're not into Christ. You don't know him. Then you're going to be put to shame in the seven years. Your stuff's going to fade. It might even be the clothes on your backs are going to fade. It's going to look ugly. 
And that's the reality, folks. Materials are going to fade during that time. Next thing I want you to see, and this is where we're going to probably spend most of our time as it relates to this study, finances will be ruined. Verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in these last days. Whew. You know, I had a fairly wealthy man, he's a believer, thank goodness, once say to me when we were studying this together, he said, Jim, don't you realize that gold doesn't corrode? How, how does, that doesn't make any sense. How does, how does that corrode? I mean, that's, that's not supposed And I just reminded him, you know, we don't know the half of it on this side of eternity. And what good is your wealth anyway if it's sitting there? And then come eternity, come a different dimension, however things go. When you, you know, when all of a sudden that becomes, as some people put it, in heaven there are streets of gold and it just becomes pavement in a new dis- dispensation, a new time. What good is your gold going to be if it's sitting it's going to turn into pavement. It's going to turn into just whatever, a common element in eternity. And I didn't mean to turn it on him. I didn't want to you know, frustrate him or anything of that nature. But the reality remains, we keep our minds so focused often on what's going on here and now, and we don't realize things are going to change up when Christ comes back. The last are going to be first and first last. There's a whole bunch of cool dynamics that are going to happen in the end times when Christ comes back and rules and reigns. All this injustice, all this stuff that just frustrates you, me, it's going to be changed. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, I don't know what you have around. Maybe oh, we got a lot of, we got a lot of toothpicks and pens and strange things that our girls somehow keep getting and poking. At you. Maybe that'll be worth gold. You know, I mean, maybe that'll in, in eternity. Yeah, I got a lot of that stuff, right? You know, whatever it may be for you and me. I got a lot of, I don't know why, but I got a lot of peppermint candy canes, probably because they're only a quarter after Christmas. You know, maybe, maybe just like Yukon Cornelius. I found me a peppermint mine. I have one at home, but it's all going to flip. And that's the reality, is that you're, the stuff that right now is valuable, and the things that like gold and silver, it's going to flip. Something, there's going to be dimensions and dynamics that happen and take place in the end that's just going to flip how things go. Look at this. This is key to understand, because when we talk about gold and silver in the last days, there are important things that you need to know. Because there's a lot of people that look at finances, especially in an apocalyptic sense, and they think, well, maybe I'll just, you know, I, I I got stocks and I got this and I got that and whatever, but maybe I'll hedge with some precious metals, gold, silver, you know, whatever it may be. And that's great. In fact, I'll be honest, I, I've done some of that in my own personal finances. But there's a dynamic here that's important to note, even for me to note, because look at this, Daniel 11, 38 and, thir- uh, 38 and 43 in the first part of that verse. We see that Antichrist is going to ruin the financial system because of a forced ep- economic globalism. And we see his dynamic here. Look in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. But in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses, a God which his fathers did not know. Uh, um, he shall honor with. Now, I, I, all that stuff we can talk about another day. What that all means. God of fortresses, who he's going to worship, honor, what all that looks like. But look at the financial things that happen here. This God is going to be honored with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. He shall have power, later on verse 43, over the treasuries of gold and silver. Folks, get this. Your gold and silver that you have, hand it over. That's what Antichrist is going to say. Hand it over. Give it up. Not, you know, sorry, you're done. <laughs> you're done on this earth. That, this is the reality, folks, of the end times. We, there are multiple passages that show that the Antichrist is going to ruin the financial system because of a globalized economy, and he's going to take what he wants for his gain and for his government and for his in, in the setup, and, and then he, he will leave you with a thing called the mark. And whatever I say you can have with that mark, you can get. And it's generally just basic necessities, not any of these things that would be common with the wealthy. Important to know, because you can, you can try to, listen, you can try to hedge against downfalls, and I think that's important in dollars and cents and all that stuff. You can't hedge against the Antichrist. Did you hear me? And those listening out there, I, and I know people that are probably going to go through the tribulation. If they don't come to faith in Christ, may they know you can't hedge against the Antichrist. 
Revelation 13, 16 through 17 says this. He causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except he who has the mark or has the name of the beast or the number of his name. And that's the idea of this. this, That's where we get. Some people wonder, where do we get this idea of a one world order? Where do we get this idea of a, you know, how does this take place? You know, how does that even look? And in fact, you can look through Daniel 11 and see that not every nation is going to submit to the Antichrist rule. And that's interesting. And again, a study for another day. But the majority is going to be forced to live underneath the rule of the Antichrist. And is going to be forced to take the mark, and he is going to rule the system. And it's not very many that are abstaining from his rule. That's all I can tell you that. You can look in Daniel 11 yourself, and you can see it's like Edom, Moab, and there's another, another, another section of land, again, kind of differences in dynamics over time. But there's very few people that are going to try to resist, abstain, try to keep away from the Antichrist. And the majority of the world is going to get sucked into a system, and he is going to ruin it. Can't hedge against the Antichrist. Second, though, let's get this second. Because all of that stuff ends up going to him, and that wasn't the point of life anyway. God's going to come back, son, Jesus. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of dynamics. The millennial kingdom, I understand that. But the reality remains, Zephaniah 1.18 says, Zephaniah reminds us, neither silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. You can't hedge against the Antichrist. You know what? You can't hedge against the Lord because it's all his. Your gold or your silver or your bank account or your this or your that or your pension plan or whatever that might be, you can't. Finances are going to be, I know it paints a bad picture, a rough picture, folks, but we need a sober mindset that whether or not you enjoy your stuff the next 5, 10, 15, how many ever years, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when this all is going to go down. But the reality remains, folks, just like I began the message and I was troubled by the thought when I was standing outside looking at my house yesterday, somebody else is going to own this. You can look at your dollar bills in your pocket, right? And somebody else is going to hold this. You can look at your bank account, somebody else is going to buy this and Probably my creditors, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. <laughs> Somebody's going to have this stuff. It's not all mine. And that's the mentality we need to have. Because it's not. The financial system's going to be ruined, folks. And it's coming. And it's coming. I know a couple of dynamics that we need to look at before we close. You, you'll see this here in verse 4. And I think it's important to note, well, actually, verse three, the end of verse 3. You have, he mentions there very clearly, heaped up treasure in the last days. Now, I want to get a good mindset on what we need to do between prepping and hoarding. There are two very different dynamics going on there. James is very clearly saying, some people look at this and they can, they can get really bent out of shape saying, well, you've heaped up all this stuff. You, you started storing up stuff. You know, all, all the stuff that you have in your basement, the stuff that you, you, know, you bought just you know, for catastrophic, you know, whatever, you prepped. That's sinful. You know, that's a characteristic of an evil man. You know, I don't know what, whatever, however they would tell you. Wait a second. Now, we know that riches and hoarding will be a last day's issue. And we can see that. Now, there are some. You can watch the prepper shows. You can watch some of those things on Netflix or whatever. I don't even know if they have any of them on right now on, on normal television. You'd have to probably go get some of these shows on, you know, some other place. But you can watch some. Some of these people are just outright crazy. Some of them are very smart. And again, you've got to kind of wait, you got to wade through kind of some of what is happening out there and how it goes because some people are, are simply hoarding. And there's some people that are really preparing. Now, note this Proverbs 22, 2 through 3. The rich and the poor have this in common. I love this. I, I added this. This really isn't pertinent to thought, but the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Isn't that the right? That's the truth. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it is God, as it says in Deuteronomy, who gives the power to get wealth. He's the one that blesses, you know, as he chooses. Um, Romans reminds us the one who shows mercy on whom he wants to show mercy. Um, you know, God, God, God is in control of all of this, and he's, and he's for you. He's for you. I don't care if you feel like he's not for you because of your bank account, because of your living situation, whatever. He's for you. This is not all there is, he's, but he's for you. So the Lord, the Lord, we all have this in common. The Lord's the maker of them all. Verse 3, though, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. Some translations say he sees calamity ahead and prepares for it. 
but the simple pass on and are punished. The humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. I like that. Because God's going to give you and God's going to give me wisdom as we traverse in these really weird times on how to prepare for our faith. He did that for Noah, the ultimate prepper. I mean, come on. Guy built a huge boat out front of his house. You know, I mean, all this stuff, storing up food. He's in there. We were talking to our our girls this last week, sharing the story of Noah. And uh, it's it's fun because they don't, you know, totally get it all, but we're trying. And uh, so we're trying to tell Grace, Grace, did you know that Noah was in the ark for a whole year? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I think, I think God, God wants him to get out. <laughs> and so, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> he needed to be in, you know, they slowly get it. But, but the reality, oh, a year, goodness, in the ark, my word, prepped a lot, was directed by God to do it. As in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You know what? God's Spirit's going to direct you and me in the places we need to go and the things we need to prep for and the ways we need to live. And that, that just needs to be taken with a good balance because we cannot heap up stuff. We need to be preparing for stuff. Let's look at verse 5, and I'm going to close with a thought, and then we'll close with some other news that I want to give you. Five and following, sorry, four and following. In the, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. With, that's the Lord of the host, the one who's watching. <laughs> that's interesting. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, and you have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. Some of us feel like we're on the receiving end of that sometimes, whether it's our, like you say, creditors or Donald Trump or <laughs> whoever it may be. I, I, they are not going to get away with it. That's the idea here. Unjust wealth is going to come back to bite them. There are a lot of things in this time, in this reality that you and I are living in, and it's just not going to be totally right. And remember, go back. I challenge you to go back. First Thessalonians chapter one, or second Thessalonians rather, chapter one, the study that we did. Remember that God is making a case against them. He, God is allowing you to go through suffering in this life, the unjust things that happen, but it's not for naught. He's doing it because he's making a case against them in a court of law that's coming one day. And that stuff's going to be laid out before these people that are unjustly Raking you over the coals, messing with your life, doing the things that they shouldn't. And he, God's going to say, look what you did to my kid. Why do you think you should get into heaven? <laughs> He's making a case against people, folks. So don't. So hang on. This is not all there is. But unjust wealth is going to come back to bite and be mindful of that. That's a reality that's going to happen. And James reminds us of that. But look on. Let's again. He's going to make a big contrast because he's saying these are those who are rich, who who really don't have any kind of saving understanding or led by the spirit. It's all about them and material and all that stuff. It's going to go away. Verse seven. Therefore, be patient, brethren. Turning the table here. Therefore, be patient, brethren. Until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. We'll talk about some of this stuff next week. You also, verse 8, be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. As we continue in your notes, I want you to mention there, put this down. Well, first off, okay, I keep getting into it myself. Lesson, lesson number one, be careful how you handle your possessions. So from that beginning part, I know that it's, there's a very stark contrast between those of verse, verses 1 through, through 5 and then those after this or verse 1 through 6 and then after this. There's a very stark contrast, but, but be learning the lessons. Because the stuff of this life, the wealth and stuff, can just pierce you. First Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith and in their greediness have pierced themselves with many sorrows. And I can guarantee you those people that are pierced with sorrows are sorrowful because they're never going to be satisfied as they keep looking for wealth and they keep looking for highs and they keep looking for new things and new stuff and they're never going to be satisfied. I think I shared with you on the beginning, at the, at the, on the front of your, your bulletin, a quote from 
um, uh, Andrew Carnegie very clearly said there, millionaires who laugh are rare. My experience is that wealth is apt to take one's smiles away. He realized the reality of wealth does not lead to any kind of satisfaction. And people that go after it are just going to be pierced. They're going to be cut. They're going to be hurt. Second Peter 3, 11 through 13 reminds us, therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, it's all going to burn, folks. What persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's why the fire has to come, folks. So that all of this stuff that doesn't matter can get out of the way. So God can bring back an earth that does now, not, 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 don't mishear me that this stuff doesn't matter and things don't count. And again, fatalism, don't live by faith. So and before, before I, 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 I go on, I want to, because I want to talk about the end, I'm running out of time. I want to give you something practically here. When we talk about finances, again, I, I don't want to hurry away too fast from this. I want you guys and us, all of us, when we deal with our finances to live in, Inside, don't live outside, and I have it up here on the screen, outside of a Second Peter 1-3 principle, which is promised to you and to me that God's divine power is able to give you everything that pertains to two things. One, life and godliness. God's promised you that. And that's a wonderful promise. But we live outside of that so very often, and it's why we're frustrated, we're discontent, um, things don't, you know, uh, have the value that they do, um, uh, we, 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 don't, we don't like life. Um, it's, it's because we have a wrong view of things outside of life and godliness. So when you invest, when you hear things about, when you hear about prepping and when you hear about the end and when you hear about investing for your family or your future or your finances, your retirement, whatever that might look like. When you think about college for your kids or your family, however that looks, whatever this may be, I want you to think of three things. And this is how I look at my finances very often. In light of first or Second Peter one three, life and godliness, is that I think of okay, what do I need to take care of my family? Because if you don't take care of your family, we see very clearly in the epistles. I, I think is is um, Paul writing to issues that are going on with in the in the life of uh, uh, the church there uh, that Timothy's over, and he's saying you know anybody who doesn't take care of their family uh, is accursed. Let them be accursed. The, the idea there is that you know. It's sin to not take care of your family. God wants you to be a good steward of what he's given you. So if you need to save, save for your family. You need to, you need to you know, you be, be careful with your finances and, and retirement and all that stuff for your family. Say, yes, keep those in mind. Get a plan together so you know in your head and in your heart and in your conscience that you are not hoarding stuff because you just don't know for a rainy day, whatever, for my pleasure, whatever it may be. But you know that your money has a plan with what it's going to do or where it's going to go. So family, I, I say church, I add church in that because godliness, how is God going to use you? God can, as you invest in the kingdom of God in your local church, can use you and use your money. It's a better investment than it's going to be in, in, a, in a, a stock market that goes like this and in world situations, especially when finances are just going to burn anyway. Why not do it and give it to something or do something that's going to stand and have value in eternity? That's God's eternal kingdom as well. Whatever that may be out in the mission field, however that may look, invest your money wisely in these ways that eternity is going to impact. Okay, I leave that for you just because I think these are three basic things that you can organize your lives around so that you are not caught hoarding. Many of us could be caught hoarding right now because we don't have a plan with our finances. Did you hear me? God could talk to you and to me and say, wait, what are you going to do with that bank account? It's full of a lot of stuff. What are you going to do with that that right there in, in your back bedroom, in your underwear, whatever, buried in the backyard? I don't know where to – what are you going to do with that? Well, I don't know. That's hoarding. That really is, folks. That's taking what God has given you, and it's saying, eh, I don't care what happens to it. It's all going to burn one day. That's true, but it, you could be using it for the kingdom. You could be using it for why God – the intention that God has given it for you, either your family, your church – or the kingdom of God. 
So I challenge you with that. Get, get, get your finances in order to the effect that you have a plan with what you're doing with your money so you're not caught hoarding. So that's, that's what we see back in Luke, and I think I gave you that in, in the um, previous section. Uh, maybe not, maybe I took it out of there. Luke, Jesus gives a very clear example of hoarding. I think it's in chapter 12 of Luke. There's a man that just hoards stuff and hoards, I'm going to build bigger barns, I'm going to hoard more stuff, more stuff. I'm going to have more stuff. And, and, and this, this silly kind of guy, this silly mentality of just more stuff, more stuff, more stuff for me falls flat when your life's taken from you the next day. And whose is the stuff after that? Your kids? Are they going to fight over it? Do you want that? You know, is it going to be the states? You know, what is, use, use your money wisely, folks. Be very careful and have a plan with what God has given you. That's, that's the mi- mindset, the idea that I want. Now, let's, let's entrust God. Habakkuk three seventeen through 19 reminds us, though the uh, fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be in the vines, nor the labor of the olive may fail. And the, the fields you have uh, yield no food, and though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there will be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's, and he will make me walk on the high hills. You know, the, this idea, this mindset, of, you know what, things are going to burn. And you know what, things have been bad in the past. He's speaking of an issue in time in, in, in Israel's history where things were rough. And you know what, things are going to get worse. So we need to have this prayer, this song, literally, that he's saying, Habakkuk saying on our lips, saying, Lord, no matter what happens, it's not about stuff anymore. I'm not going to fall prey to the, the life about stuff anymore. I want, I want to live in, in that regard that trust God and that all of this stuff that I have is his. And, and so that's why we need to look at our wealth. I, I know I, I've ran out of time, thank goodness. I guess I'd have to get to it next time. Lesson two, get ready, the Lord is coming. That's a very clear warning there in chapter, in verse 8. I love this. He just says very clearly, You be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And we'll revisit this next week. So be patient. You can put this in your notes. Be patient and be established in the work and the word. You can put that in your notes, but we'll, we'll tackle that more this next week. I've got, man, and this is, this is news. I've got three or four more slides about news that are going to take place, that are taking place right now. You're going to have to come back next week and catch it. I apologize. I want to get you guys to lunch and get that stuff before it, done, before it rots, right? Um, there's a lot going on, guys. There's a lot going on. i got two sections that I want to talk to you about, specifically the globalism, the economy, that, that shows that the Lord is coming back very soon. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we see very clearly um, the, the land issue of, of Israel, the tr- cup of trembling that they have become. Um, the last two weeks has had more news about it than I think even as that I can see has happened in recent years. Um, so it's coming, folks, and you'll have to come back next week here, there, in the air if, if, if we make it. We'll see. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for these that are here today, Lord, and, and I know... And I know that everybody here wants to do, I believe, really what you, in their heart of hearts, God, led by the Spirit, those who know you, want to do what you've called them to do with their wealth. Lord, help us not to hold on to this stuff like it's ours forever, because it's not. It's not even ours right now. It's yours. So, Lord, when we deal with our finances and we deal with these issues at the end, Lord, let us not be people that would be classified or be even confused with those who are rich or those who are living for stuff. Thank you for the contrast in this lesson that, God, you've given us to be a people that aren't ruled by stuff, but we're led by your Spirit. We're full of faith. No matter what happens with what we have, God, you're in control. And, God, that you are for us and not against us. And, in fact, we really believe that as we look to the coming of the Lord again, the bringing things back into submission and line with you, Jesus, in your rule and reign, that we believe that, that you're going to let us be taken out of the worst of the worst, the judgment that's coming on those who don't believe. We thank you for that. We really do. And, and, and yet, Lord, again, let these things, these characteristics of rich people not be of us. God, may we be Continue to be givers. God, there's so many givers in this church that are just amazing to see. And God, how they put you first and their, their families. And, and, they, and they, they, they give so generously. 
And, and God, that's so wonderful. And, Lord, I just pray that you continually align their lives with your word. And, God, if there's any kind of materialism that's gripping anybody here, Lord, I pray that they just let it go. God, that we really hear your word today. God, we come back with anticipation next week because we really do believe, Jesus, you're coming soon. That's a glorious thing. So, Lord, until we meet again, Lord, we just say come. Come earlier than that if you want. And we just will give you the praise and glory for whatever you do. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 It's in your son's name.